Good morning. We're glad to see you all here today as we get ready to study the Word of God together. I want to invite you to take out your Bibles and open them up to Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to continue our study in Nehemiah and today we're going to be in chapter 9. If you didn't grab, uh, if you didn't uh, bring a Bible with you, you can grab one of the pew Bibles there in front of you and turn to page is it 370? I think it's 370-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and that's where you can find Nehemiah. If you, if you brought a Bible with you and maybe you're still um, learning where things are in the Old Testament, maybe you're not quite familiar with, with the book of Nehemiah or where to turn, the easiest way to get to Nehemiah is just simply open your Bible to the, to the middle. And you might be in Jeremiah, Isaiah, perhaps the Psalms, and just begin working your way backwards towards the front and look for Job, J-O-B, it looks like Job. Next door to Job is Esther, and then right next door to Esther is Nehemiah. So that's an easy way to find uh, Nehemiah, just simply going to the middle of your Bible and working your way, uh, working your way backward. But uh, wherever you are, we encourage you to be um, following along with us uh, with the Word of God, because we want to hear from God this morning and what He has to say to us through, uh, through His Word. And we believe He's going to speak to us today, uh, particularly through Nehemiah 9 and the themes that we're going to find Nehemiah 9 sharing with us. One common question that I, uh, that I often get as a, as a Bible teacher throughout the years has been, why does God seem so different in the Old Testament than He does in the New Testament? There's some, uh, in fact, there are some teachers out there that say that God is fundamentally different. That in the Old Testament, you do get a God of, of anger and of judgment and of wrath. But in the New Testament, you get a God of mercy and grace and peace. So you get the lion in the Old Testament and then the lamb in the New Testament. And friends, what I want to share with you this morning is that God does not change. God is consistent all throughout the story. God is loving. God is just. God is holy, God is merciful, and we see that consistently throughout the entire Bible. So it's an inaccurate stereotype to think that we have one version of God in the Old Testament, and then he switches and becomes different in the New Testament. And what we're going to find from Nehemiah 9 today is that God's desire for his people is consistent the whole way through the Bible, the whole way through the Bible. And what he ultimately desires for us is fellowship. Fellowship, that relationship, that connection between us as his people and with him as our God. And so today we're going to see how God calls the people to renew their fellowship with him. Renew their fellowship with him through confession and repentance. And then we're going to see how that applies to us now in the New Testament and how the call is exactly the same. There's some mechanics that are different. There are some differences in terms of how it gets worked out. But that is God's desire and God's plan is consistent the whole way through. So my hope this morning, friends, is that you would see more of God's character, more of God's heart, and see the wonder of the salvation we've been given in Jesus Christ that was planned from the beginning of time and it is carried throughout the Old Testament and then manifest in our day through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts this morning to hear from God, um, God's word. Father, we ask that, ask that now as we turn our attention to your word that you would instruct us and show us how you are the God of covenant, the promise keeper, who desires fellowship with us, your people. And you call us to renew our fellowship with you by us confessing our sins and bringing them to you and having you cleanse us from the inside out. So this morning, Father, as we study your word and we, as we study this, this ancient story from Nehemiah, that we would see how it applies to us today through our Lord Jesus Christ. And George, in Jesus, we ask that you would continue to be exalted in our lives as we live lives of ongoing confession and repentance towards you, knowing that you are the one that forgives us and cleanses us and enables us to have fellowship with you and with you, God our Father. So we ask that you would be glorified this day through the reading of your word and the hearing of it and applying of it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, friends, for those of you who may just be joining us this morning, we are going through uh, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah together as a congregation. So I just want to get you caught up on where we are in the story. Um, Nehemiah takes place after what was called the exile. After what was called the exile. So in the Old Testament, uh, you have um, God forming the nation Israel and Israel continuing to turn their back. On God, God sends prophets to the people, the people reject those prophets, and through a series of ungodly kings, God finally brings 
judgment on his people. The northern tribes are taken into captivity by a nation called Assyria. And a generation later, in 586, the Jews are taken into captivity by a nation called Babylon. The temple is destroyed, and they are forced to leave their land. And they become slaves all over again, just like they were in Egypt under the the ungodly uh, king called Pharaoh. However, a miracle happens, and in 539, a new nation ascends to power called, uh, called Persia under a king named Cyrus, and this pagan king has mercy on the Jewish people and allows them to come back into their land and reorganize once again. So in 516, we have the temple rebuilt, and then in 458, Ezra the priest comes to the community to begin to renew them spiritually, and then in 445, we have Nehemiah coming onto the scene. And Nehemiah's main task, as we've seen so far, is to rebuild the walls, to secure Jerusalem again from foreign enemies. And we found that those walls being broken down and not rebuilt were a symptom of the the low spiritual condition the people were at. So Nehemiah comes to not only rebuild their walls, but restore their fellowship with God, restore their their commitment to the covenant that God has made with them. And so we saw in chapter 6 that miraculously, under Nehemiah's leadership, the walls are rebuilt. The walls are finally rebuilt. And the whole project took 52 days. So imagine the walls being destroyed for hundreds of years, and then suddenly they are rebuilt very, very rapidly under the godly leadership of Nehemiah, who calls the people together to work. This last Sunday, we heard from Pastor Stan Um, from Nehemiah chapter 8, how the people are gathered together under Ezra and the word of God is read to them. The law of God is read to them. And they, for hours, they are sitting there listening to their covenant history as Ezra is reading to them from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And they're being reminded of their history and they're being reminded of God's covenant promises made for them. And many of them begin to weep and to, uh, to show great grief and sorrow over their sin. But Ezra and Nehemiah say, no, today is not a day of weeping. Today is a day of joy for your God has remained committed to you. Your God is pleased with you and bringing you back into the land. Your God has not quit his big plan yet. Your God is still committed to what he wanted to do from the beginning of history. And so what is this big plan that the people were reminded of this last week that they were to rejoice in? Well, friends, I've said this to you before, for those of you who have been uh, part of our congregation and have heard my, my previous teaching on the Old Testament, that God's big plan in summary form is to dwell among his people in fellowship and love. That's God's big plan. That's what God ultimately has been about from the beginning of time. Now, I've also said to you in the, in the past that one of the most important verses in the Bible that shows God's big plan comes from one of the, for many people, one of the least interesting or perhaps least inspirational books of the Bible. Um, and that is the book of Leviticus. So uh, every new year when people renew their commitment, I'm going to read through the Bible in a whole year. They get excited. They read through Genesis. They were reading through Exodus. Uh, they get to Numbers. And then all of a sudden it's like they hit Deuter- Leviticus and all that momentum just kind of slows down. Because it's, uh, it's a complex book about all these animal sacrifices. And it becomes a little bit tedious. However, in chapter 26, God speaks these words to the people which summarize his big plan. And it's this that I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I've broken the bars of your yoke, and made you walk erect. This is God's big plan. This is the heart of God being expressed in Leviticus. This commitment God has made to walk among them and to be their God, to dwell among them, to not reject them, and to liberate them from their slavery, that they should be his people and he should be their God. Now, Leviticus 26 also tells us that there's conditions to this covenant. There's conditions to this covenant. And in verse 27, the Lord says, if you, if in spite of this, if you'll not listen to me, And if you walk contrary to me, if you reject my offer of fellowship, know this, that I will scatter you among the nations. 
and I will make your land and your cities desolate and a waste. But then God says, but if you turn back to me, verse 40, if you turn back to me and confess your sins, then I'll remember my covenant that I made with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob, and I will restore you. And then we get this wonderful promise in verse 42, uh, or sorry, verse 44, where the Lord says, yet for all the rebellion that the people are going to do, for all the rebellion that they're going to do, and for him taking them out of their land, it will not break his covenant with them, for he is their God. Verse 45, I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So here in Leviticus 26, you get the whole plan of God. His desire to dwell amongst the people, and the conditions for the covenant, and then the prophecy that everyone's going to turn away from God, and that one day he'll send them into exile by these ungodly nations, which of course happened under Babylon and Assyria. But then when they turned to him in confession and repentance, he would remember his promises to them, and he'd restore them once again back in their land. Now this is Nehemiah's generation. They are the generation that has experienced this restoration. They are, the, they are the, the generation that has experienced God's mercy again. And so what we find here in chapter 9 is that they're going to do what is called out for in Leviticus 26, and they're going to come and publicly repent now and confess their sins and renew their commitment to God and renew their fellowship with him. So in chapter 9, we're going to see that Nehemiah and Ezra call the people to renew their fellowship with the Lord by confession, repentance, and commitment. Now what we're going to do in chapter 9 is just work our way through it. And what I want you to do is just listen. Listen to what the people heard. Listen to what the people heard because we're going to hear the Old Testament story going all the way through to the current moment. So if you're here this morning, you've never really read the Old Testament, haven't done much exploration for it, hopefully Nehemiah, well, Nehemiah 9 will be a, a helpful summary for you to see what God did, what God promised, and how the people responded. But what I, what I want you to listen for is the way in which God continues to show mercy to the people. All throughout history, continues to offer his invitation of fellowship to them, and how people continue to reject this offer. And yet God graciously continues to offer his hand of fellowship to them again and again and again. And imagine you're there with Nehemiah's community, hearing this story and being reminded of your history and being at this moment where you must make a decision, are we going to be like our forefathers or are we going to be a new generation and say yes to what the Lord is offering us? So, Let's begin here in verse 1 of chapter 9, and let's just listen to the word of God, listen to what's being taught and told about the character of God, the plan of God, throughout the entire history that the people have had up until this moment. Verse 1, now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and, in, and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites, on the, on the stairs of the Levites stood these Levite names, which I won't read and get bogged down with. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites stood and said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be, his glory, be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Now listen to them. Remind the people how God invites them into fellowship. Verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. And the hosts of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur, out of the, Ch the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offering the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. 
and you've kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of the cloud, you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them by commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. Good news, amazing things that God did in calling Abraham, forming them into a nation, rescuing them out of slavery, and then promising to bring them into the new good land that he had promised to Abraham all those generations before. But then look what happens, verse 16. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Now, if you read the story in Numbers, you find this is exactly what happened. They're in the desert, they're complaining, they don't like Moses, they want a different leader, they want to go back to Egypt where life was so much better. But listen to what God does. Listen to what God does. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, their feet did not swell, and you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to each of them every, and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon the king of Heshbon and the land of Og king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess." So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and their peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land, and took possessions of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness." But then look what happens. Verse 26, nevertheless, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. In the time of their suffering, they cried out to you and you heard from them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you. And you abandoned them into the hand of their enemies so that they had dom dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules. Which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets. Yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hands of the peoples of the lands. Do you see? God's love, his grace, his steadfast mercy, and the people's ongoing rebelling and saying no, 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 no to all the good things God offered them. 
And then finally, they are cast off and sent into exile under the foreign nation of Babylon. The northern tribes are scattered under Assyria. The, southern, the remaining southern two tribes a generation later under Babylon. And then we get to verse 31. Then we get to verse 31. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Do you see this, friends? God does not change. You don't get the God of anger and judgment in the Old Testament and then the God who is nice and merciful in the New Testament. God stays the same. And his mercy is written all over the Old Testament. And the people under Nehemiah are acknowledging this. So here's their commitment. Listen to what, listen to what they're being called to now. Verse 32. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom, amid your great goodness that you gave them, in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day. In the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts, behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you've set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and are over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Because of this, all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests." So the people come, they confess, they don't want to be like the previous generations, they want to believe what we see in Leviticus 26, and behold, God's good plan, his big plan to walk among them and to restore them, and so in confession and repentance, they're going to make a commitment back to God in light of his mercy, in light of his steadfast love. And in light of the fact that he has continued to offer them fellowship again and again and again. Now next week we're going to see the details of the things that they're actually going to pledge towards God. But this morning what I want you to see is the way in which fellowship with God happens in the Old Testament. Because it sets up a pattern for us to understand fellowship today under Jesus Christ that we have in the New Testament. But again, I want you to see this and see that there's not a difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. It's the same God. It's the same goal. Fellowship, renewal, restoration. Listen to what, uh, what the summary is here. Number one, there's the invitation. God graciously invites his people into fellowship with himself. Started back with Adam and Eve, then to Noah, then to Abraham, and all the way through. God always makes the initiative and invites his people into fellowship with him. That is his big plan. That is his ultimate desire for us. But then God's people must then confess their failure to maintain that fellowship with him. Confession and repentance is not a negative thing. It's a good thing. For it's what clears that relationship and restores it so it can actually happen. When God's people refuse to confess when they refuse to repent, when they refuse to acknowledge their failure to keep this covenant, that's what incurs God's anger, God's wrath, and God's justice. But as, God's, as, as the people confess, as we've seen so far, God always responds back with more mercy. Confession is always followed by God's mercy. God never turns away anyone that is willing to confess or to repent or to turn back to him. And then finally is that reacceptance. There's an invitation, a confession, and then there's that reacceptance in which God's people accept his generous offer and his conditions for fellowship. God's people hear the invitation, 
they confess that they've not kept it, and then they re-accept the invitation again and accept the conditions that God gives to maintain that fellowship with him. So here's your main idea. Here's your main idea. God's people experience fellowship with him by acknowledging his gracious invitation, confessing their failure to maintain it, and then re-accepting the conditions of his offer and recommitting themselves to this God and to his steadfast love and to his mercy and to his plans. So what does this mean for us today? We see how this worked out in the Old Testament. We see how this is working out with Nehemiah's community. Next week we'll talk about the specific commitments that they're going to make to God. But what does this mean for us today under the lordship of Jesus Christ? What does this mean for us today, who, for us who live on the other side of the cross? Because we do have a fuller revelation of who God is. We do have a fuller revelation of God's plan in Jesus Christ and what our Old Testament uh, forefathers had. What does this look like for us? What I want to do with you briefly is show you from 1 John chapters 1 and 2 that the same pattern emerges, the exact same pattern emerges under Jesus Christ that we see in the Old Testament. But this pattern that we have under the New Testament is of a better guarantee, a greater picture of God's mercy, greater picture of his grace, greater understanding of what that fellowship with him actually entails and what it really looks like. So to begin, God invites his people into fellowship with himself, not through the law of Moses, but through Jesus Christ, God's son, who died and rose again for us. Listen to 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we've seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to you. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In other words, John is saying, I'm writing these things to you because I've seen him and I've known him and I've touched him and I've walked with him and I have fellowship with him and I want you to have that same fellowship too. So here it is. It's now found in Jesus Christ. But there is conditions for this. There's conditions. God cleanses believers for fellowship with Christ through Christ. God cleanses believers and prepares them for fellowship with Christ through Christ. Again, listen to what John is going to tell us. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie, do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children... I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, that is the atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In other words, you're invited into this fellowship. And the way to experience this fellowship is to confess that you're not worthy of it. To confess that you don't deserve it to confess that you're not able on your own strength to even maintain it, and then to experience the grace of Jesus, the blood of Jesus offered for you in all of your sins. You don't come into fellowship with God because you're worthy or because you've made it somehow or you've achieved some kind of a standard. You come into fellowship because you are needy, you are desperate, you are broken, and Jesus 
receives you as you are. We just sang that song earlier, as you are, because he has taken care of those conditions by offering, him up, offering himself up for your sin, for your new beginning, for your restoration. Friend, there is no sin that can keep you from fellowship with Jesus save one. There is no sin that can keep you from fellowship with Jesus save one. And that is simply unbelief. Unbelief. If you refuse and say no and act like our Old Testament forefathers did and have a hard heart and a stiff neck and say no to the offer, that's the only thing that can keep you. That's it. It's our own hard hearts. But if we would say yes to Jesus, believe that this good news is actually true, that it's real, then the fellowship that Jesus and the Father share together together is offered to us, and that is what's called eternal life. And eternal life is being offered to you by your Savior. Again and again, God offers life to the Israelites, and again and again, they say no. And now life is offered to the world through Jesus Christ. What say you? What say you? Now, if you look at your past, you think like, well, my past is shady. It's too bad. I've done too many things. There's no way God could off, uh, you know, possibly even love me or care about me. Yeah, it's good to hear about Jesus dying for other people's sins. But my sins, they're too great. No, they're not. That's your pride speaking. That is simply your pride and your own unbelief speaking. There is no sin that is too great for the Savior to cleanse and draw you back unto himself except your own pride and unbelief. So if this is true, if what John said is true, if John is is, is an accurate witness, if we take John at his word, that John knew him, talked to him, walked with him, And John says, this guy died not just for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And if you confess and turn to him, then he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness and prepare you for that which you've been made for, which is fellowship with God. Then it can be yours. Will you say yes to Jesus? The ultimate and final revelation of God and God's heart. The fulfillment of Leviticus 26 the God who actually lived and died for us, who actually literally walked among us, took on human form, and came to be an atonement and a sacrifice for the sins of the world so that you and me may have fellowship with our God once again. So here is the final piece then. God's condition for except for ongoing for experiencing ongoing fellowship is obedience and love to Christ saying yes to him acceptance listen to what John writes and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments whoever says i know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his his word in him truly the love of god is perfected by this we may know that we are in him whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked how did jesus walk by loving and trusting and believing in his father by loving trusting obeying and believing in his father and loving those whom his father also gave him to love, which is the world. How do you walk in fellowship with God through Jesus? Doing the same thing Jesus did. Loving and trusting and obeying. And when you mess up, you confess, and he cleanses you, and you turn back to him, and you go back to loving, trusting, and obeying the father, the same way that Jesus did. So it's all set up for us, friends. The only thing holding us back is our own unbelief. The only thing holding you back from all that the Father and the Son offer to you is just simply your own stubborn pride of saying no. Trying to do it on your own, not believing you're worthy enough, focusing on yourself, on your own sins or your own issues, on your own apathy, whatever it is, it's not on God's initiative, it's on us. 
the same way it was in the Old Testament. I just read to you Nehemiah 9, which is a summary of the whole Old Testament, and you saw how God again and again offers himself to the people and how they again and again say, no, 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 no. Well, this morning, friends, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offers himself to us. God the Father offers his fellowship to us. Will we say yes? Will we confess our need for him? Will we confess that we can't do it without him? Will we confess that we've fallen short of him? And will we receive what he offers to us? I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know the struggles you're having, the doubts you're having, the pain you're going through, the sins you've committed, the skeletons in your closet. But God knows. God knows. And the offer is still the same. God sent his beloved son to the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus, the righteous one, has died and has risen again and extends his invitation to you. What will you say? What will you say? Friend, my hope is that today you will say yes and you'll experience the life that he offers, the forgiveness he offers, the new beginning he offers, the fellowship he offers. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we don't want to miss out on your grace this day. We have seen from your word that you have stayed true to you, yourself, your word, your promises all throughout history. There is no difference between you in the New Testament or the Old Testament. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your big plan is still the same, to have fellowship with us, to walk among us, to be our God, and that we would be your people. Your desire is for us to respond to you in trust and devotion and worship. And just like our forefathers rejected that offer, Lord, you still extend it to them in your mercy. You now extend your whole mercy to the world through your son, Jesus Christ. And you give that offer to us today. And I pray, Lord, that we would not miss out on what you're offering to us simply because of our own stubborn unbelief. So break our hard hearts, Lord. Break our resistance. Smolder our apathy with your love and draw us sweetly to you, Lord Jesus. You are the Savior. Draw us to the Savior today, Holy Spirit, we pray. That we would see what we've been offered in you and that none here would reject or miss out on the grace you've given to us through your death and your resurrection. So I pray that for anyone here today who needs to be renewed, that today be the new beginning for them. I pray for today, for anyone here today who has been far from you, for whatever reason, that today be the day that they be drawn back. And I pray there's anybody who's been walking in darkness, that today would be the day that they would see your light, confess their need for you, and experience the fullness of your grace and your salvation. For you are the one who's offered yourself for our sins, that we may have fellowship, which is eternal life with you. So I pray all these things, Jesus, in your mighty name together God's people said, amen. Now receive the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Let's go in peace, my friends, and let's serve our God together.